Now this morning, as I mentioned earlier, I want to major on the great statement um, in verses 25 and 26. In fact, not even the whole of those two verses. I particularly want to major on the I am statement that's there at the beginning of verse 25. Chapter, John chapter 11, verse 25a. Jesus said to her, that's to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus' words. Now, this is a proclamation of the awesome power of Christ for those who believe in him. Jesus here isn't simply informing us about his own nature. We can read, for example, elsewhere that he is the eternal life who was with the Father. You can see that at the beginning of John's first letter, 1 John chapter 1, verse 2. But this here is about more than that. It's about what Jesus has come to be and to do for those who believe. We can see how those who believe comes twice in verses 25 and 26. Whoever believes in me, whoever lives and believes in me. That's who this great statement is for. I am the resurrection and the life. For those who believe in me is what Jesus is saying here. And so, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus' words, him saying those words, is a proclamation of the gospel. It is Jesus proclaiming himself as the power of God unto salvation, specifically as the power of God unto resurrection and life for all who believe in him. And so, Jesus' statement is rich, glorious, it's packed with significance. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus there is setting himself before us. He is preaching himself to us. And that's what we want, isn't it, this morning? We want Christ in heaven to preach himself to us through his word. So in this statement, Christ sets himself before us in his mighty power to save. And so we can look at three things this morning. First of all, we can look at the multiple senses of life and death that the Bible speaks about, and in fact this passage speaks about as well. The multiple senses of life, the multiple senses of death. And then having sort of set the scene, as it were, with that, we're then going to see, um, we're then going to think of Jesus' statement, I am the resurrection and the life, in the light of his own resurrection, which is surely the substance and glory of that statement. And then finally we're going to apply that to ourselves. So let's begin then, first of all, with the multiple senses of life and death, the words life and death. Now this may be familiar to many of you, but maybe not to all of you. The Bible, including this passage that Steve read to us, speaks of death. Let's just consider death. It speaks of death in two sorts of sense, at least. One is physical death, the physical death of our bodies. That's the one we're familiar with. That's the one we have all the funeral directors on on our road for. Physical death, and and Lazarus in this uh, passage was in this state at this point. He was physically dead at this particular point in time. The other sort of death is spiritual death, a state of being estranged from God in our sin. Right at the beginning of the Bible, just after the creation of the world, in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve sinned. They disobeyed God, the first sin in the human race. And the day they did that, they died. Now, they didn't physically die, but they they spiritually died. God had said in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, God had said to Adam, Eve didn't exist by this point, but God had said to Adam, in the day that you eat of the fruit, so, so there's the Garden of Eden, God had said you can eat from any tree you like, any fruit you like, apart from that one. The day you eat of that fruit, you will die. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. And they did die. I've, I've, I've been in a, in a place where someone who, who um, ought to have known better has said, well, well they didn't die. God, it didn't happen. And God was wrong. No. God wasn't wrong. The day they ate of that forbidden fruit, they died. Adam and Eve died. They were, and, to, and to prove it, they were thrown out of God's presence cut off from God with a cherubim, with a flaming sword to stop them coming back into God's presence. They died. They spiritually died that very day. They entered a state, a horrific state, that Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 calls being dead in trespasses and sins. 
And so Adam's first sin caused spiritual death to come to the human race, not just to himself, not just to his wife who would come from him, but from the whole human race that would come from him. We've all inherited Adam's spiritual death. And Adam's first sin brought, brought both types of death into the world, in fact. On that very day, he died spiritually, thrown out of God's presence, and then years later, he died physically. Both types of death are a result of sin. There would have been no death of either kind if there were no sin. We need to grasp this. Because evolutionary thinking has gripped the West. And evolutionary thinking says there's, there's death all over the place before, before the human race even comes to existence. No. God says, death followed sin. We have to get that right. As the thread follows the needle, death follows sin, not the other way around. Let me just look at this. Just turn with me to Romans chapter 5. It's really crucial we get this firmly embedded in our, in our minds and we believe it in the face of evolutionary thinking which denies it. This is, why, this is the theological reason. This is, I think, the prime theological reason why evolution is manifestly not true. Because evolution says that the whole process of God creating the world involved death of all sorts, violent death. But Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. You see, death comes first, sorry, sin comes first, and death follows. Sin's the needle, Death's the thread that follows. Death follows sin is a consequence of sin, and so death has spread to the entire human race. And so both types of death, physical death and spiritual death, are a result of sin, a result of Adam's first sin. They both came into the world as a result of Adam's sin. When a person who is spiritually dead physically dies, in other, words, in other words, when both of these two deaths come together, as it were, then a person in that state goes to what Jesus, in Luke chapter 16, verses 23 and 24, calls anguish and torment. That is a terrible state to be in. To be spiritually dead and physically dead. A few weeks ago, we looked at Matthew 25. We saw that the, the great judgment of the world, the, the division of the entirety of humanity into the sheep and the goats. The sheep are invited to, into the, the eternal inheritance prepared for them. The goats, where are they sent? They're sent into the eternal fire. Jesus' words in Matthew 25, verse 41. The eternal fire is what Jesus speaks about there. That's where those who are not saved will be sent on that day of judgment that Jesus speaks of in that passage, Matthew 25. We can see, for example, in Revelation as well, many places, um, Revelation speaks about a lake of fire, a lake, of, a lake burning with fire and sulfur, and it describes that as the second death, Revelation 21 verse 8 and various other places as well. So this is what salvation is all about. Maybe you're not very familiar with church, I don't know. There might be some here who are not familiar with church. And, and you, you occasionally hear Christians talking about salvation, salvation. What is all this salvation? Here, this is what salvation is all about. It's about being saved from the second death. It's about being saved from the lake that burns with fire and sulfur and is described as the unquenchable fire. That's how John the Baptist describes it. An unquenchable fire. That's what we need salvation from. Those who die in their sins, to use Jesus' phrase in John 8, verse 21 and 24, those who die in their sins go there. They go to torment, they go to anguish, they go to a flame. They go to eternal fire, the second death. Now the wonderful good news for those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation is that death has lost its sting. In other words, when a believer, a Christian believer, dies physically, they don't go to this torment, they don't go to this anguish, they don't go to this 
unquenchable fire. No. They go to be with Christ, as Christ himself promised the thief on the cross next to him. Do you remember the thief on the cross? Not right next to him. He's converted on the cross. We know that because there are only two thieves who are crucified with Jesus, and they both hurl abuse at Jesus to start with. But one of them changes. One of them is converted as he's hanging on his cross. And Jesus, in that beautiful moment in John, uh, sorry, Luke 23, verse 40, uh, 23, verse 43, says, today you will be with me in paradise. That's what salvation is. Being saved from that fire. And so that, that, that man, that thief, that converted thief, for him, death lost its sting. He, he went to a very different death from what he would have done if he hadn't been converted those few minutes earlier. And so a believer, any believer, not just that, that thief, but any believer when they die is saved completely from all trace of the horrors of the unquenchable fire, the lake of fire. Theirs is rather an inheritance of joy and of glory and of being with their God and Savior forever. Now it's for this reason in our passage that Jesus is so reluctant to speak of Lazarus as having died. Do you remember? I did, we didn't read from verse 1, but... Um, some of you at least were here last time, a couple of weeks ago, when we looked at uh, John 11 from verse 1. And uh, I'll just read a few verses in a sec. But, but there's a reluctance of here for Jesus to speak of Lazarus as being dead. Because dead to Jesus means far more than just the, the body being lifeless and in a grave. So, so listen to John 11 verses 11 to 14. After saying these things, he, Jesus, said to them, that's to his disciples, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, because they, all they know is that he's ill. They don't know Lazarus has died. And so they say, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. So Jesus is willing to use the language of died, but it's not his go-to for, some, for a believer, for one of his own, for one of his sheep. No, he doesn't like to speak of physical death as a death because it's such a different experience from somebody who dies in their sin. Lazarus was a believer. We can see that from verse 5. Jesus loved him. He's one of Jesus' beloved sheep. One of, his, one of Jesus' own. And so Lazarus' experience in our passage of being four days physically dead was not the horrific experience of the unregenerate in the fires of hell. And in fact, there's no return from the fires of hell. I think it's unthinkable that anyone could go to the fires of hell and come back into this life. No, Lazarus' experience was very different. He had four days of being comforted in heaven. And I remember my previous pastor wondering out loud if possibly Lazarus wasn't too pleased about coming back to earth again. I don't know. I don't know. But wherever he was, I mean, whatever his, his, his thoughts were on being raised again, uh, he before that was, was comforted with the Lord in heaven. So, so is it any wonder then that Given the horrors of all that the word death signifies, and they are horrible, they are horrible, it is a horrible thing that death signifies. This fire, this unquenchable fire that you just get a one way ticket to if you die as an, as an unbeliever. Is it any wonder that Jesus recoils from calling Lazarus as dead in our passage? He doesn't want to speak of Lazarus as dead. Dead means that. Dead means the fire. Lazarus hasn't gone there. He's just, his body's asleep. He, well, to use Jesus' language. Now, we see physical life and death as the big things, don't we? And yes, physical life does matter. God made it. We must uphold it. It is a bad thing when a life is taken. So that's, for example, uh, why the abortion issue matters so much, as we prayed about earlier. It matters. Now, Jesus in no way denies that physical life matters. And in fact, the ultimate hope he promises his people is physical resurrection. In the second half of verse 25, we can see that. I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, physical death, yet shall he live after that in physical bodily resurrection. 
But life in Jesus' mind is not simply about being alive in this mortal body. Life is so much bigger than that. Life is so much more than that. As we just saw, a believer may be physically dead, their body in the grave, and yet they're with God in heaven, in their spirit, full of joy. And so their state has far more of a flavor of life to it than of death, doesn't it? Hence Jesus says Lazarus is asleep. Conversely, a person who's physically alive and yet estranged from God in their sin and heading for that horrific, unquenchable fire is in a state far more accurately described as death than life. They're under God's wrath, dead in transgressions and sins, as Ephesians 2 says. So life, the life, the life that Jesus came to give his own is not simply about neuron activity and and a beating heart. It's this, chapter 17, verse 3. It's to know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. It's to be reconciled to our creator and sustainer and our judge. To have our judge for us and not against us. That's life. It's to be known and loved by the God that we've offended with all our sins and have all our sins and offenses taken away as we thought earlier. That's life. And that's the life that Jesus came to give his own. And it culminates in resurrection at the last day, as we see in this passage. But it doesn't wait until then to begin. It doesn't even wait until a person departs this life and and goes to heaven as, as, as a believer. The life that Jesus came to give us begins in this life. Jesus came to give eternal life. He came to give life in abundance. And it begins in this life. It begins when a person is born again from above, as Jesus told Nicodemus in chapter 3. And and when that person is born again by God's Spirit, they come to believe in the Lord Jesus as their Savior. And they love him. And they begin a new life of obeying him with, uh, with their heart. And that's the life. That's when the life really begins. Do you see how verse 26 says that a person who believes in Jesus shall never die? On the face of it, it seems to contradict verse 25, where Jesus says, whoever believes in me, that he dies, yet shall he live. Well, verse 26 says a person who believes in Jesus shall never die. Well, that's clearly a different sense from what verse 25 is talking about. That's not talking about physical death. This is talking about spiritual death now. So a person who believes in Jesus, yes, they will go through physical death if the Lord doesn't come first. But the physical death will only be a gateway to the joy of being with their God and Savior in heaven. A person who believes in Jesus will never experience the full horrific reality of death, the sting of death, the fires of hell, the condemnation of God. And so at the moment of new birth, life truly begins, and it gloriously never ends. When a person comes to believe in Jesus, as many of you have, when a person comes to repentance and faith, they begin this new life, they begin this eternal life that Jesus calls it, this life in abundance, and it endures all through the ravages of physical deterioration, and physical death. And then at the moment of death, it continues without interruption. That is a glorious thought to have at a Christian funeral, isn't it? That their life has continued without interruption for that believer who's died. It continues without interruption in heaven while their body's in the grave. And then finally, and most gloriously, it culminates in physical resurrection. So we've looked at these different senses of life and death, and we've seen that spiritual life is, is really where it's at. Physical life, yes, that is promised. That is, that is the, the final prospect as well, the physical resurrection. But it's the spiritual life of, of being reconciled to God through the Lord Jesus 
this is, this is life that we begin now. It carries us all through eternity, through our death, through our resurrection. Now, what I want to show you is how Jesus is this life. Jesus, in our verse, verse 25, says, I am the resurrection and the life. He doesn't say, I give the resurrection and the life. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, that is a mighty statement. And it's clearly linked to the miracle of this passage, the raising of Lazarus. But it's even bigger than that. Because Jesus here says he is the resurrection and the life. Where is the substance? Where's the power? Where's the reality of that statement? I put it to you, it's in Jesus' own resurrection. That's where the substance of Jesus being the resurrection and the life is. If Jesus has never uh, 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 um, risen to life himself, it's hard to see how he is the resurrection and the life. It's easy to see how he gives it to Lazarus, for example. But being it, but bringing Jesus' resurrection into the picture, and then, yes, of course, that is the cornerstone of this statement. He is the resurrection and the life because, because he is. He, he, raised himself, he, he, he raised himself from death. At his, as it, at his resurrection, Jesus goes from being dead in every sense to being alive in every sense. He thought about the different senses, and that's what we're going to think about now. Jesus goes from being dead in every sense to being alive in every sense. And by exerting this mighty power in himself, in our nature, that, in other words, as a man, then he's doing this for us. He gives the corresponding thing to those who believe in him. I am the resurrection and the life, says Jesus. I was thinking about this verse when we, Elaine and I visited Gatwick Airport recently. I, I, I'm fascinated by these sorts of places. You see these huge, huge chunks of metal improbably flying over your head. It's just, I'm fascinated by it. And I think maybe we are, aren't we? These things that defy gravity soaring into the skies. These, these massive, whatever they are, Airbus things, I can't remember the name, that just about gets the end of the runway and then it's up they go. I, I think it's brilliant. I could just spend all day there, really. I think I, we're probably fascinated by them because things don't naturally rise. It takes something special to, to rise. It takes something special for a massive multi-ton aircraft to, to get itself off the ground, doesn't it? Something pretty special. It's easy to fall... Anyone can fall, anyone can fall off a log, as the saying is. But to rise, that's something special. It takes power, something glorious. We, the human race, fell, didn't we? That was easy to do. Adam and Eve did the easy thing. They fell. Genesis 3, they fell. They fell into sin and death and condemnation. Once all too briefly, our race was sinless and there was no death, as we thought earlier. But then we fell. We fell into those things. And from them we can never pull ourselves out. But what we couldn't do, Christ has done. Rising to everlasting life and justification. And if if the flight of aeroplanes is fascinating, how much more glorious is this? We especially see the mighty power of the Lord Jesus who is the resurrection and the life, as we consider the state he was in before his resurrection. And this, for me, was a very fruitful chain of thought, and I I hope it is for you as well. I want to think about the the state that Jesus rose from. Because this is the key thing, you see. Jesus isn't just the life. He's the resurrection and the life. He gets to life from non-life. So I want to think about where does he start from, as it were, in being the resurrection? Well, he clearly rose from physical death to physical life. That's, that's testified in, 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 the, in the Bible, isn't it? All, all those accounts, the physical eating of the fish and so on after he's uh, raised again. But it wasn't only that. You see, Jesus rose from the very lowest of the depths that we'd fallen to. Jesus rose from being dead in our sins, which he bore on the cross. Jesus rose then not just from being physically dead, but also from being spiritually dead. He rose from the second death. 
He rose from being under the full measure of God's judicial condemnation and wrath at our sin. Jesus rose not just from fatally suffering uh, suffering death by crucifixion, but even more, Jesus rose from fatally being thrust through with the sting of death, being fully expended in him. In the terms we thought earlier, earlier in the service, Jesus rose from the shame and guilt of dying with all our sins and pollution and uncleanness and offenses poured out on him. That's what he rose from. That's the starting point where he reaches the glory of resurrection life. Do we see something of the power of the Lord Jesus here? Do we begin to see how he is the resurrection and the life? Who else can rise from the depths of hell to the glories of everlasting life? Jesus can. Who else can rise from being dead in every sense, buried with the wicked, crushed for our iniquities, to being imperishably and gloriously alive again, bathed in the Father's favor and acceptance and affirmation of righteousness? Who else? Jesus can. What we thirdly now need to see is that all of this, Jesus being the resurrection and the life, is for us. He didn't just do it for himself. He did it for us, for those who believe in him. You see, Jesus didn't need to rise from death to life for himself. Even less did he need to experience death at all for himself. No, it's for us. It was all for those he came to save. It was all for his sheep. It was all for his beloved. That's who he's the resurrection for. That's why he stepped into our flesh to save those who have this same flesh, to raise us as he raises himself. It's for the raising to eternal life of those who believe in him. It's to give us spiritual life before the Father, a life where all our sin is atoned for and forgiven and taken away and washed away, a life where all God's justice is satisfied, a life where all God's wrath at us is appeased and all his condemnation is ended and all his favor is restored. That's the life Jesus came to give to us by his resurrection. And on the last day to raise our bodies too. Let me ask you the same question that Jesus asks Martha in verse 26. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Do you believe he's the son of God, the Christ, who was to come into the world? To give eternal life. Are you trusting Jesus personally to save you from being dead in sin? To save you from condemnation and wrath? To save you from the the fires of hell? Are you trusting in Jesus for that? For yourself? Now some of you will answer with a heart full of yes. Others not. Let me just speak to the former first. To those who, who... who answer, yes, yes, I'm trusting Jesus to save me from all of that. If that's you, then let me just give some words of encouragement from, you, uh, from this this morning to you. You see, as we see this power of Christ, as we've been thinking about him being our resurrection, him being the resurrection of the life, it's for us. He's the resurrection for us. He's the resurrection for our resurrection. He's the life for our life. Some of you may be struggling with sin, Others of you are struggling with with physical frailty. For some it's the frailty of the mind. Some it's the frailty of the body. Would you see the one our passage sets before us? The Lord Jesus Christ who is the resurrection and the life. Who by his own mighty power rises from the very depths to the very heights. Do you see that? He's for you. He's done this for you, for all your need, for all my need. He does it for his own. And so see the Lord Jesus in all his sufficiency, all his power, 
So whether you need his power for, for, for overcoming indwelling sin, and we do need his power for that. There's no way of overcoming sin otherwise. Whether you need his power just to get through another day, then this one who is the resurrection and the life is exactly whom you need, whom I need. He knows your situation. Just as he knew Mary's and Martha's and Lazarus's, he loves you just as you love them. He's full of grace for you just as he was for them. Maybe some of you need to renew your trust in him. Do you see how Jesus does that with Martha in this passage? He takes Martha three, as it were, takes Martha by hand and, and builds her faith. Do you believe this? Maybe for some, it's, it's, today is a day to renew your faith in Christ. If so, then respond to his prompting today and renew your faith in his, in his great, all-sufficient power for you. And then just finally, as I close, let me address those who have no personal trust in Jesus. There is power in the Lord Jesus Christ to raise the spiritually dead. I can testify that into, uh, in my life, and, and many others can as well in your life. There's power. If you've never experienced this power, if you have never put your trust personally in Jesus, then know it. Know that there is power in Jesus to raise you from your spiritual death. There's power to raise us from a lost, fallen state, to raise sinners from death to life in every sense. To raise people from God condemning them in their sin to God welcoming and counting us righteous and receiving us and, and receiving us as his own in the Lord Jesus. Have you glimpsed anything of this power this morning, this power of Christ? Do you see your need of him to save you? And so will you not believe in him to take away your sin, to take away everything that is taking you down to, to, to the, the full sense of the second death? Will you not believe in Christ to raise you to everlasting life in its fullest sense, a life reconciled to God, a life received by him and a life finally resurrected from the grave. Will you not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Let's pray together.